Chapter 7, Blood in the Snow. Alternate Anagram Chapter Title, Hobo Tinned Owls. Pawnee and Pam exchanged a worried ferret. They couldn't make Anna see reason when she was so blinded by the special love a girl feels for her pony. But they couldn't leave the world of the living to save a millennia-old pony who was closer to a god than anything else that ever trod the earth. Either. The worried ferret squirmed out of Pam's hands and ran off to worry elsewhere. Pam sighed. We'll go to hell with, with you, she said. Anna turned back around, tears welling up in her eyes. Maybe you and Acorn... Acorn can be redeemed, said Pawnee. Maybe the cat... And death itself aren't as powerful as we mortals think. But promise us... You won't turn back as we leave the underworld, said Pawnee. Or Acorn might be pulled back in. Pam rolled her eyes like, we get it. You know a bit about mythology. You want a fucking pat on the back? Where were you when I learned numbers, huh? Anna wanted to hug her friends. But she knew it was dangerous to show affection, since it could be taken as a sign of weakness. Acorn had taught her that. Then it is settled, Pam said. We follow that fucking cat and descend into hell together. Then we find Acorn, free him from the eternal damnation that he is surely suffering at this very moment, and lead him back with us, where he will live out the rest of his sinful days, haunted by the knowledge of what awaits him when he inevitably is pulled back into the pit. And then we can all ride our ponies down the Pony Pal Trail, Pawnee blubbered excitedly. Anna smiled at her friends. Thank you. Pony pals stick together, said Pam. Acorn seethed as he watched Mino smugly shit off the edge of the lone tree stump in the middle of the dead clearing. Acorn wasn't sure what it was with which he was seething. Rage, self-loathing, jealousy. But seething, he surely was. When will the other two judges fucking get here, Acorn snapped. But Acorn, said a voice behind the pony, we've been here all along. Acorn spun around and saw two figures standing on, or were they hovering slightly above, the gray, marshy ground. One was a tall, middle-aged woman in a plum-crushed velvet pantsuit, whose glasses did nothing to hide the keen glimmer of her brown eyes. There were a few streaks of silver in her wavy brown hair, and they imbued her with a sense of dignity like a... Uh, fuck it, I'm bad at descriptions. The other person was a really rad dude with really rad shades, who needs no introduction. Who are these douchebags? Acorn whinnied. The rad dude spoke again. We're the douchebags who wrote you. Wrote me, Acorn said. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? It means that you're a fictional character, the woman said. That's right, said Dirk Strider. He hadn't introduced himself as Dirk Strider yet, but it should be totally obvious who he is. No need to be coy. And the woman's Jean Betancourt, the author of the original Detective Pony. Let's not pretend this was any sort of dramatic revelation. You're a text, Acorn, Dirk continued, and I'm going to fucking deconstruct you. You wouldn't dare to. That's a daring proposal. I dare you to, to try, Acorn said falteringly. Can't get that uh, Derrida pun to work, huh? Minos observed dryly. Fuck you, cat. I'll get it eventually. All puns aside, Acorn, Jean Betancourt said, yes, you are a character from a book that I wrote. And Dirk, well, I'm not sure exactly how he's involved in all of this, but apparently he wrote it too. Dirk waved his hand dismissively. Don't worry about it, Jean Betancourt. Doesn't matter. If you say so, Dirk... There, they've introduced each other. So now everyone knows everyone else's name and can refer to each other accordingly. <clears throat> the point, Acorn, Jean continued, interrupting my didactic parenthetical edification, is that we created you, so we're in a unique position to judge you for the horrible things you've apparently done. Apparently, Acorn whinnied, so you don't even know what it is that you're judging me for? They don't know your sins yet, Dirk said. I'm going to have to read them. He pulled a thin, worn paperback book from his back pocket. Its purple cover showed a picture of a pony and was defaced with some vulgar and hilarious text. Read being a loaded term, of course, Dirk said as he began thumbing through the paperback. Vocare versus legere. Isn't it funny that the English word read doesn't distinguish between reading silently and reading aloud? We need to employ separate modifying words to clarify. The father phoneme and the filial grapheme reunited by ambiguity. 
Minos and Betancourt rolling their eyes, as if the two of them were desperate gamblers down to their last dollar, and said eyes were their lucky paradise. Or as if the cat and the woman were political prisoners, and their eyes were the final cigarette they were preparing for their stalwart comrade, before he was dragged out into the snowy courtyard of the palace-turned-prison to face the firing squad. Or as if they were star-crossed Italian lovers forced apart by cruel circumstance and trying to draw out the moment of their departure for as long as possible, and their eyes were the R's, and their final Arrivederci. Or as if they were pastry chefs, and their eyes were the dough for the royal tarts that would be served a few short hours later at a hastily assembled diplomatic dinner called in response to some urgent socio-political crisis and the resolution of said international kerfuffle depended on the cooperation of the second Archduke of Belgium, who was as notorious for his capriciousness as he was for his sweet tooth. They were rolling their eyes pretty fucking hard, is the point. Dirk continued, undeterred. The closest we have to a unique verb for to read aloud in English is probably recite, from the Latin recitare, which can mean either to repeat from memory or to read aloud. But the English recite is almost exclusively used to refer to speaking from memory, not directly from a page. After all, how can one recite, cite again, without the initial citation from brain to page? The mind is an indeterminate step between text and mouth, words being inscribed on the surface of the brain before being spoken. That word, inscribe, is really the heart of it all, isn't it? Skirbere, to write. Inscribe, not just to write, but to write into, to embed words in the page. A reversal of the standard interpretation of causation slash power. Page, writing into man, the source and the receiver of the violence flipped. Speaking as reading, reading as speaking, reading as writing, writing as reading. So when I say that I will read your sins, it should be clear that I am simultaneously reading them and writing them, and it should be equally clear that there is no difference at all between those two actions. What the crash shitting fuck are you talking about, Acorn Nade? Dirk shrugged. You tell me. But all pedantry aside, I should tell you how this will go down. Now, Acorn, even the most cursory examination of your crimes makes it apparent that your soul is unfit for any sort of reward in the afterlife. But torture and torment hardly seem right either. Yes, we won't be making a choice between heaven and hell, Betancourt said. It's much more weighty than that. It's a choice between existence and non-existence. Minos nodded. We, well, the two of them, have direct control over your narrative. They can rewrite it so that you never existed at all. The question is not what you deserve, Dirk said, but whether you deserve. With the sins that you have accrued, Acorn, do you deserve to have ever lived at all? Acorn pranced and snorted. Do you think I give a shit? Erase me, delete me, whatever it is you'll do. Non-existence doesn't scare me. Dirk shook his head. No, Acorn, I know that you don't give a shit. He turned his head slightly so a beam of light glinted off his sunglasses in a cool and dramatic way, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. But I think that Anna would give a shit. <laughs> Acorn finally stood still. Just hurry the fuck up and judge me. 17a. Minos. Do you remember why we have come here today? Is it not true that our purpose is to hear the sins of this pony known as Acorn? And is it not further true that the three of us, after listening to said sins, shall make a judgment concerning the fate of Acorn's existence? Acorn. Well, yeah, Dirk said all that just a few moments ago. Betancourt. Yes, Minos, all you say is true. Minos. And what form shall our judgment take? Is it not true that each of us shall cast their own vote? And whatever ruling has gained the majority of the votes shall be enacted. This seems a just system. Is there anything I have omitted from my telling? Dirk. Nothing, Minos. Betancourt. True, it is just as you have said, Minos. Acorn. Why are you speaking rhetorical questions? Minos. Very good. And now, Dirk, you, I suppose, should speak next after duly calling upon the gods. Acorn. What's going on? Dirk. All men, Minos, who have any degree of right feeling at the beginning of every enterprise, whether small or great, always call upon God. And we, too, who are going to discourse of the nature of sin, of guilt, and of punishment, must invoke the aid of gods and goddesses and pray that our words may be acceptable to them and consistent with themselves. Acorn. Why is my name in front of everything I say? Betancourt. 
Come then, clear-voiced muses, whether you have gained this epithet because of the quality of your singing, or because the Ligurians are so musical, grant me your support in the judgment that my colleagues and I shall soon make. 17b. Acorn. And what are those numbers and letters over there on the left? Minos. Let this then be our invocation of the gods, to which I add an exhortation of myself to speak in such manner as will be most intelligible to you, and will most accord with my own intent. Acorn. Wait, I know what's happening. Betancourt. A good and fair invocation. Now it must fall upon Dirk to begin the reading of the sins, while Minos and I listen attentively and comment on occasion as we see fit. Minos. Excellent Jean. And we will do precisely as you bid us. The prelude is charming and is already accepted by us. May we beg of you to proceed the strain. Acorn. I won't play along. We're not making this into a platonic dialogue. Dirk. I certainly shall, Minos, despite the fact that some of those gathered here are making things harder than they need to be. Acorn. No, fuck you. I refuse. The pony defiantly kicked his name off the page with his powerful hooves. Acorn. That's better. Betancourt. Acorn, please, don't make this into a whole thing. Acorn. Fuck you, Acorn said, after he kicked another acorn into the abyss. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you in the symposium you rode in on. Dirk. You're not really in any position to argue with us, Acorn. We're doing this. It's happening. 17C. How far up your own ass to... Hold on, I need to take care of this, too. 17C. He kicked the 17C into the growing pile. Goddamn Stephanus pagination. Betancourt. Can't you just humor him on this one, Acorn? That's kind of how we arbiters do this thing. I mean, if it were up to me, we might try... Dirk. Oh, come on, Betancourt, it's tradition. Minos. It's formal, I like it. Betancourt. Of course you'd like it, you'd get to be Socrates. Acorn. I'm not going to go through with this needlessly complicated and pretentious dialogue bullshit just so this glasses-wearing fucker can get his rocks off. Besides this asshole... Acorn derisively tossed his head in the direction of Minos. I already wrote me into two pages of Terzarima. Betancourt. Oh no, was, hang on, let me get that for you, Acorn said, and then sent yet another prefix into the bottom margin with his powerful hooves. Thanks. Was it metered? Betancourt asked. Iambic pentameter. At least he didn't insist on hendecasyllables, Betancourt said, crinkling her nose in repulsion at the thought of those particularly odious feet. That's a good pun, Dirk whispered to nobody. Minos. All right, fine, we can... Acorn cocked one of his back hooves. Minos word threateningly. Fine, Minos huffed. Seventeen C better corn acorn better corn acorn better corn acorn better corn acorn better. There, no more dialogue. Happy? Acorn. Very. You don't have to be an asshole about it, Acorn, Jean Betancourt said. The two girls in the town shrugged through the snow silently. Pawnee and Pam had left Lightning and Little Seb behind miles ago. They told the ponies to return home and had pointed them in the right direction. If they just followed the trail in a straight line for a few minutes, they'd be back at the barn. But the girls didn't hold out much hope that the ponies would make it, because, as has been covered earlier in this book, ponies are incredibly fucking stupid. At this very moment, Little Seb and Lightning were probably freezing to death, or falling off of cliffs, or trying to eat each other, or some stupid shit like that. Fucking ponies. Fucking ponies. Hurry, said Anna. I can feel the other side tugging at my very sinews. We're close now. Here, kitty, kitty, Anna called. With vicious sarcasm. It was all starting to become clear in her mind now. The cat, her friends, her own death, her new life, the detective pony. All was converging, all was colliding, all was rushing to a climax. A revelation trembled just past the threshold of her understanding. And here, where the birch forest of Wiggins and the Chthonian depths of hell overlapped, Anna felt at the center of an odd, religious instant. I hope that hell has an open bar. I finished the last of my backup flasks hours ago, said Pawnee. She had a serious problem. This was a cry for help. Anna stopped, bothering to project even the slightest pretense of caring about these antics. Anna pointed to the ground. This is it, she said solemnly. This is the point of no return for me. I can feel it. Once we cross over, I can never re-enter the world of the living. Pawnee gasped in shock. Pam just nodded. I was ripped from this realm once, Anna continued, and it won't let me escape its grasp again. I know I can't change your mind, said Pam sadly. I know you love Acorn more than you love life. And, apparently, more than you love me. Oh, Pam, you'll always be the one that got, got away, Anna said, voice shaking. And Pawnee, Pawnee, 
You're pretty cool, too. The girl. girl in town, removed by this uncharacteristic display of emotion from Anna. The three held hands and took that all-important step forward. Nothing around them visibly changed, but they could all feel it. They were damned. Pawnee touched Anna's shoulder and pointed at the ground. There's blood in the snow, said Pawnee, just like the chapter's title. Anna saw the blood, too, Rage. gathered in her eyes. Pam stopped and held up a hand. Listen, she said. What's that? The girl stood still and listened. Anna heard a faint meow. It's a cat, she whispered. She smiled. Her smile was far redder than blood and far colder than snow. While wearing a powdered wig. And finally, number 666, Embezzlement. Dirk closed the book, tucked it into his back pocket, and looked at Acorn. Truly an impressive and intimidating list of sins. Betancourt shook her head sadly. Minos looked solemn. He wasn't even shitting, which is kind of his character's gimmick, so you could tell he meant business. Are we ready to make a ruling? Dirk asked. Acorn reared up on his hind legs and whinnied tempestuously at the three arbiters lined up in front of him. One fucking moment. Don't I get to say anything in my defense? Weren't you listening to my whole big thing about speech and writing? Dirk asked, obviously annoyed. Grapheme versus phoneme and all that. Do you really think the subject's speech holds any power in the world of a text? What is written is. What is merely said vanishes instantly if there is no one to record it, like invisible water off the ass of an invisible duck. And we're done recording you. Acorn seemed ready to argue, but Minos held up one of his adorable little white paws to stop him. Dirk is right, Mino said. He may be a pretentious douche, but he's right. We, the three arbiters of the afterlife, have heard the evidence, and now we must decide what your fate shall be. Not so fucking fast, a girl's voice shouted from the distance. Acorn's ears instantly twitched up. Could it be? It could in goddamn deed. The trees of the dead forest behind the arbiter shuddered. Dirk, Jean, and Minos turned to face the commotion and nervously inched back. A deep rumble slowly built, louder and lower than thunder, making the ground shake as if a train was approaching, a train of the gods. The bone-white trees swayed wildly in the windless air. They violently uprooted themselves, floated weightlessly in the air for a briefless moment, and then hurtled to either side with savage force, disappearing into the horizon. Through the newly parted past, silhouetted by a blinding, otherworldly glow behind them, walked two girls and a town. Jean Betancourt squinted into the blinding light. Are those... That's right, said the girl leading the way. The bright light faded and the three walked into view, posing like a team and looking like complete badasses. Anna Harley stood at the mouth of the gorge that she had just carved into hell and grinned triumphantly. We're the motherfucking pony pals, and we're here to fuck... Shit. Up. Detective Pony was originally written by Gene Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Gene Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee.